and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Project Management in the Real World Key Success Strategies. I'm going to hand things over to our featured presenter. He is Executive Leadership Coach and Professional Development Consultant, Mr. Brian Ackles. Brian, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, Kelly, and uh, thank you all for joining today. This is a, a, a topic which is very, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, just by way of background, I've been uh, I've been running uh, large projects in the telecommunications industry, amongst others, for uh, more than about 25 years or thereabouts. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of project managers. I've trained a lot of project managers. Uh, worked with a lot of program managers and program directors, etc. Uh, and what I really want to talk about today is not the project pieces of all of this about the skills of a project manager and the tools that, that we use as project managers, but really focus, really focus in on the leadership skills and focus on the word of manager uh, and what leadership skills, how they're critically important to the success of running any kind of project. And, and like this overview slide says, delivering success is due to the PM's ability to successfully lead and motivate people to create a unique result. Because we all know as project managers, we're not doing the work. We are coordinating the work, we're organizing the work, uh, we're working with stakeholders to make sure that we're delivering what is expected on a particular project or a particular program of work. So let's focus on the leadership, let's focus on some of the key areas that are uh, really important for project managers to have uh, good skills in and to really excel in. And this is all about being successful. One of the first things that comes up uh, in any discussion around projects and project success is the issue of communications. There's been a lot of discussion about why projects are successful or not. Uh, and in the projects uh, that I've looked at and the projects that I've done some uh, triaging on, one of the biggest things that I've, that I've found and that my colleagues have found is that really good and effective communications is probably the cornerstone of making any project work and making any project successful. So the quote from Tony Robbins is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty important in this. To effectively communicate, we must realize that we are all different in the way that we perceive the world and use this understanding as a guide to our communication with others. So this is recognizing the fact that as project managers, we're working in large diverse organizations, we're working with a diverse customer group, we're often working uh, with people we may not have worked with before, so we're, we're always struggling and we're always trying to find better ways of communicating and, and better ways of understanding how we communicate and how to make sure that our communications uh, from our project team's perspective, both outwards and inwards, uh, are effective. So we'll talk a bit, bit about communications and then we'll move on to some other topics. So as with all good things in project management, project management, managing communications is key. So the idea, is, of course, is to build a plan, to build a, build a communications plan and identify what information is needed and who needs it. Uh, this is pretty fundamental stuff and, and we, all, we all know this. The, the challenge is, is we all can often get lost in the assumption that we have identified all of the people. So we need to take a really deeper dive into this often in our organizations and try and find different ways of figuring out who we need to be talking to. So for instance, if you're taking on a project in a, and, and working with a group in an organization that you've not worked with before, how do you find out which stakeholders are going to be key to your project and, and which, uh, you know, who needs to get information? There's, there's many ways of doing it. I think probably chief among them is just to sit down and talk to as many people as possible. Talk to the resource owners, talk to the department managers, talk to the uh, area managers, uh, whatever the structure is within your organization. Find out what they know about the project. Find out uh, if they know about the project, if it affects them in any way. Um, and start to build a map, start to, start to plan out how these people need to be need to be worked with, what information they need and when they need to get it. So find different ways of both gathering information from them and also getting information out to them. 
we'll talk a little bit more about this, but it's the, the challenge we have today is, is actually how we communicate with people. Do we pick up the phone? Do we send them a text? Are we using IM platforms at work? Uh, is it by formal email? Are you writing, are, are people wanting, you know, very, you know, formulaic reports? Uh, is it a face to face meeting? There, there's thousands of ways to do this and, and the technologies and the enablers now are making it that much more challenging, I won't say difficult, but challenging for the project manager to determine what is the best way to communicate with people. And also recognizing that not everybody wants to be communicated with in the same way or requires the same level or the same detailed information. So it's a, it's a constant blend of, of tactics and a constant blend of, of information uh, and communication and tools and technologies that we're always trying to focus on. So work on who needs to know what. Um, and this, this is the biggest thing towards success. Understand who needs to know what's going on with your projects and programs of work. So looking at upstream, looking at the project sponsor, of course they need to know. Uh, looking at the business owner, the people that are that, that are actually paying for this, so the controller, the finance group. If you are working in a in, in a in a program of work, what other other project groups or sub project groups need information from you, uh, or where or what information do you need from them as well? Looking downstream, look at you know understanding who your customer is. Uh, are you dealing with end users or are you dealing uh, one level above the end users? Are you dealing, uh, how are you dealing and communicating with your team? Are you, is all of your team co-located in, 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 one, in one office? Are they spread out amongst the buildings or are they spread out around the world? And I'll talk more about managing remote teams as, as we move through this webinar, but understanding who needs to know and how you best need to communicate with them. Uh, look at who is relying on what you're doing, who is relying on the outputs of your project. Uh, and the interim outputs of your project may be feeding into another project, which is part of a program of work. So having that mapped out and having that very clearly defined is going to be very key to success. And this is all about communication, planning and communication understanding, and also understanding the organization. So being aware of how your organization is structured means that you need to understand and you need to know how information flows within the organization. How do people find out what's actually going on? And this, this is, this is a, quite a deep question in some ways because there's a formal work chart and there's always people that, that uh, you know, there's, there's positions of responsibility, they're defined, there's teams of people that work with them, you know, organizations can be siloed or they can be flat uh, depending on the structure of the business and where organizations are in their development. But the communications flow and information flow within the organization may not relate to the actual formal structure of the organization. A lot of times it's trying to find out who the key players are and who the key uh, people are within the organization that actually have the information you need or conversely need the information that you have. Uh, and and how, does that, how does that flow of information work? Do you have to go up the chain and then back down to people? Uh, I've actually worked in organizations where uh, I had to go through my manager who would talk to another manager who would then get information from one of his reports or her reports and then send that information back to their manager who would send it to my manager who would then let me know about it. And that's an information flow, not a very good way of information flow within an organization, but that still exists today. So you need to understand it you need to understand what those mechanisms are. I'm hoping you don't have to deal with that, of course, but that particular type of example that I had, but it can still exist. Understand the strategic direction of the organization. Is what you're doing, or not is what you're doing, hopefully what you're doing is certainly related to the strategic direction, but understand and be able to clearly identify how your project is linked to the strategic direction of the organization. And the only way to do that, of course, is one, to have access to that information, uh, have access to the strategy, being able to talk to 
um, the owners of particular parts of the strategy within the organization and, and make sure that there's a common understanding uh, as to what your outputs are uh, from the project, what you're trying to achieve and how that supports um, the strategy of the organization and, and the goals of, of the group that you're working with. And again, it's all about communication and information flow to make sure that you have access to these people, that you're engaging with them properly. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways in, in terms of how you, different ways of communicating with people, and we won't get into the, to the details of this, but just a recognition that you need to be able to adapt to others' um, styles of communication, as well as understanding what your own is. The last piece of this organizational awareness puzzle, of course, is, is understanding the culture of the organization. And the culture of the organization is, if you're stepping into an organization that you don't know or that you've never worked with before, um, understanding the culture can take time. And if you're only going in as a project consultant, for instance, if you're going in on a, as a contract project manager, it can be difficult to peel back enough layers of the onion to truly understand the culture. The best thing you can do in this situation would be to talk to as many people as you can to find out how just, you know, again, how things work there, how they do things, how they talk to each other, uh, what the expectation is on how people work, hours of work, uh, you know, the, the fundamental parts of how an organizational ticks. And that can give you some insights into what the culture is actually like. Is, is power concentrated in one area of the organization or is it equally spread amongst other areas? Who, is, who are the key people that people always want to talk to and always want to make sure know what's going on? Um, is, there a, is, is it a very command and control structure or is it a very collaborative structure? And that you'll be able to see pretty much straight away from the types of meetings you're getting into and the types of communications that you're having. But all this builds towards building this, this organizational awareness and understanding how information moves within the organization. As you're building out your stakeholder maps and as you're building out your communications plan, of course, one of the tools that we commonly use is this idea of convergence. So you're looking at the different different groups that you're talking to. You might be talking to you know, sales functions, technology functions, support functions, and they all have different requirements from your project. And you're looking to ask, you're looking for information from them as to you know, what, they, what they want from whatever it is that you're delivering. So you're looking for ways, you know, sales might be, it's all about on time and keeping the company, customer happy and future opportunities. Uh, support, you know, looking for making sure that we can maintain this thing uh, once it's delivered. Technology, something that works well but using state-of-the-art systems so we don't have to use old technology and building something for the future so build a map like this table and look for areas of convergence areas that support each other so uh, creating future opportunities uh, that's a might converge well with uh, the technology piece develop a solution that works with all systems so if you're satisfying the customer uh, and you're building something, the technology group is building something that works with all of their systems and that's going to create future opportunities and keep the customer happy. If you're using the latest technology and you're building state-of-the-art systems, well, from support, uh, hopefully state-of-the-art also means that it's easy to maintain and that they are standard technology platforms. You're not moving into something which is a bespoke custom built solution so that support can actually have access to tools and actually have access to resources uh, that they can call in to help support them. So you're looking for ways of dealing with the commonality, but you're also trying to identify areas where there might be conflict. And again, identifying the conflict early on as a project manager, when you're defining what's being done, means that you can actually address it. And again, if this comes back to how you communicate with people and how you get information from them so you can actually have an understanding about what each group really wants. And again, effective communication. It's all about, it always, always, always come back to effective communication. There was a phrase popularized by a guy by the name of Marshall McLuhan in 1964, uh, the medium is the message. And I won't 
delve into the sort of philosophical arguments or discussions behind that. But if you think about that, if you think about the mediums that we use for communicating, Twitter, 280 characters. What can you say in 280 characters? And what does that do to your ability to communicate? How do you squeeze information in? Um, short message services. Uh, again, there's a, usually a limitation to the number of characters, although that's growing. IM platforms are following the trend of, of how much you can actually send over an, over an IM or over a chat session. And again, we don't want to be writing a novel in a chat session. So the types of mediums that we're using to communicate also dictate the style of communications that we're, that we're putting out. So uh, if people say you've got a, a, an in-house uh, SMS system or an in-house IM system that you're using to broadcast out information to a group, the information that you're sending out is by need and by, by platform design and by platform choice, going to be very brief so it's going to be you know just quick hits of content update quick hits of updates and that might be suitable for some people on, on within your stakeholder community but others in the stakeholder community might want a more formal report so again understanding the type of medium that you're using and what its best use is uh, is very key to being able to be successful and be an effective communicator the last piece of this that we'll talk about right now is, is, is thinking about your style and your learning style and your communication style. The way that you learn and the way that you communicate really is, is, first of all, you have to have an understanding of that. You have to understand what your style actually is. So are you an auditory, visual, or kinesthetic type of person? If you're a uh, visual learner, and you're talking to somebody or you're giving information to someone who else who is also visually oriented, then you're sending diagrams and you're sending uh, you know, charts that show information and the visual to visual communication works pretty well. But if you're visual and uh, you're dealing with someone who's more verbally or auditory um, preferred style of communication and learning, then it's going to be more written material and you're going to have to take the time to adapt to that style because they're the people that you're trying to communicate with. There's a lot of information on this slide. I won't get into all of it, but you see that it, the, the main point of all of this is you have to understand your own style of communication and your own style of, of receiving and, and getting and giving information. By understanding your own style, you also have to understand and be able to recognize what other people's style is. And it's incumbent on you to adapt your style to theirs, to understand it was particularly when you're giving information. Uh, hopefully they'll be adapting their style to you when they're giving you information, but yeah, we, we can only control what we do ourselves. But the more we learn, the more we can also talk about this within the organization and, and build this uncommon understanding about communication. So we'll, we'll touch back more on communication as we move through this, but I want to talk now about politics. And people sort of cringe when you say, you know, organizational politics. When somebody tells you, you know, I don't, I don't play politics at work, um, they're actually telling you that, yes, they do, uh, but they've chosen not to engage in a particular way, but they're also making a statement. Organizational politics is a fact of life. We are politically motivated. We are political people. This is not a bad thing. And the, the, this is the challenge is we, we hear the word politics and we think it's, it's, a, it's a bad thing. People in organizations have different requirements and they have different things that they're trying to achieve. And this, this, this comes out within the politics. What I'm talking about here, though, and what, what I'm trying to focus on is the idea of ethical politics. You need to be able to stand up and, and know that you're acting respectively, respectfully towards everybody in the organization, that you speak well of others and you speak plainly, that you're not acting for your own best interest, you're acting with humility. You're working about managing and understanding your emotions and understanding how they affect other people. You're taking responsibility for your successes and your failures. And you're also taking responsibility for your team's successes and your team's failures. 
Like you're the one, you're the project manager, you're the project lead, you're the program manager, you're the pro program director. You're the one who is there ultimately responsible for the success of what, what is being delivered within the programs and projects that you're, that you're working on. And ethical politics is also about building and, and maintaining a good reputation. Right? You want to be known as the person that others, others can count on. You want to be known as the person that when they come to you and ask you a question, you're going to give them a clear answer, a plain answer, which will either help them or not. It depends, but it's, it's, it will give them the information they need. And one of the answers that people also need to start getting used to giving is a very simple answer is, I don't know. You don't, you don't ever stop there. Uh, the answer of, you know, can you help me with this? Or, you know, what, what about this or that or the other thing? And you say, I don't know, but let's talk about it and let's figure out who does know and we can figure out how to fix this. So you want to be known as that person that is, that is engaging and helping others as well. That's about ethical politics. You need to develop your political intelligence around an organization. And all of this around intelligence and about political decisions, decisions are not necessarily made on facts. Decisions can be made on perceived intuition, priority emotion. They can be made for any reasons. And this is really when we start talking about managing change within an organization or managing change within a project is understanding how political decisions are made and who, why decisions are made and you know, the types of relationships you need to have with people so that you know what decisions may be being tried to be made and how they might affect your project. So you start to look at the idea of building a political intelligence plan. And this doesn't have to be something formal. It can be uh, just something that you're, you know, you're aware of either mentally or if you want to jot, you know, jot yourself down a few notes. Understand how decisions are made understand who makes them and where they're made in the organization because they're not often they're, they're often not made in the formal hierarchical structure of the organization they might be made by another person who has influence in the organization so understand who that person is and understand where they sit in the organization build alliances within the organization i mean work with other groups and other teams of people so that they know um, who you are, you know who they are, you start to build a rapport with them, you start to understand what their needs and their desires are, and they also come to know you, and they also come to know that, you know, you're going to always deal with them fairly and ethically. Also be consistent. Be consistent and be yourself when you're dealing with organizational politics. You can't really fake this. You are who you are. Um, you want to be the person within the organization that people trust and that people go to. Um, and then that requires that you deal with people consistently. And, you know, in the words of Shakespeare, and I might be paraphrasing this, to thine own self be true. Right? You need to understand who you are and how you work. And that's not saying that you can't uh, improve yourself as well if, you, if there's areas that you want to change and you want to get better at, but also recognize what those areas are. So build your political intelligence, build good relationships, form good alliances and coalitions. Understand that you've got to have a really big and good network within the organization. People have to know you. Work at understanding what motivates people. Like what do people want? What does the salesperson want? Right? What does the account manager want? What is the account director looking for? What are they trying to achieve? Um, is it's, you know, is, is if you're in a for-profit organization, you're looking to, to build your market share, you're looking to uh, influence the direction of technology perhaps going into the future, so you're taking the lead in the marketplace, uh, you're looking to, you know, certainly uh, expand the bottom line of the business, there's, there's all kinds of things and there's all kinds of different areas that uh, motivate people. And, and motivate what they're trying to do. You need to work to try and find out what that is. And this is often driven by the strategy of the organization as well, because this, the strategy, you'll find that there are champions for pieces of the strategy. And that 
those champions will be and the strategy that they're they're championing will be what motivates them so understand how that all works and lastly of course manage your own reputation um, find out what people think of you at work uh, are you projecting or are, are people thinking about you the way that you think you are in your in yourself if people uh, I'll give you an example if you believe yourself to be a good speaker and that you uh, portray an aura of trust and you hear from people that they say well you know you don't people don't really trust you when you talk now that's a very extreme example but if you start hearing that you might want to try and find out why people think that when you know when you truly believe that that, that you're trying to you know, you're portraying trust when, when you speak uh, and it could be just how you're delivering. And, and again, I won't get into the details of, of why something like that might happen, but it's an example of getting feedback on from other people on how they perceive you. And that helps you also manage and adapt, manage your own reputation and also correct misinterpretations before they get out of hand. Understand the landscape, understand who your supporters are, uh, understand who the detractors are understand the people that may not be fully behind what you are trying to do with the project um, find out what their power is what their under what their priorities are what their perspective is and find ways to work with them so that they understand and will become maybe not a supporter but not somebody who's blocking your project as well try and get them to at least neutral being politically effective means you're working towards a win-win solution. You're not trying to beat somebody at work. Right? You're looking for tactics that will get you to where you need to be. And this idea of backcasting and looking at your future desired state and then trying to find the tactics and the courses of action you need to actually get there. And again, if you're talking to people, you're, you're finding out what motivates them, you're looking for your supporters, you're looking for your detractors, you're looking for information on them. That all comes into this idea of uh, determining your tactics to move forward. You're looking at what you want to do, and what you want to do is achieve the goals and objectives of your project and of your program. So that's, that's your starting point. Our future desired state is defined as this is what we mean by success in our project. So what are the tactics we need to get there? Now the tactics are, of course, you know, building the product or service that the project is doing, but also um, gaining support from the right parts of the organization, uh, dealing with people in, in the right way, communicating with them in the right way so that they understand what's doing and that they're also gonna be providing you and your team with the support they need to actually get to that future desired state. And that is about, that is what being politically effective really really means and there is absolutely nothing that is unethical in any of this it's only unethical if you're building a strategy that is going to force somebody to lose and then that's not what we want to be doing in any organization or in any business okay so we've talked about communications and stakeholders. We've talked about the political effectiveness and, and building political intelligence, which really gives you a handle on managing change within a project, because the more you know people, uh, the better you know what's motivating them, the better you know what's driving them, the more you'll be have, have an understanding of where change might be coming from within the organization. So now let's move on and talk about your project teams. And, and particularly, I want to spend a bit of time on managing uh, remote and virtual teams. This is more and more common, as we all know. Uh, we don't have people that are working all in our own offices, um, and you know, our remote remote team might be people spread around different buildings uh, on a campus, uh, on a business campus, that can introduce some of the same issues and, and implications as having people working all over the world, which is also more and more common. Uh, I work with a lot of multinationals, both as a as a, as a consultant and within my normal uh, my normal day-to-day -day activities and it's not uncommon that we're working with people who are using a follow the sun support model where if there's a major issue it goes from one 
one group it goes to the next group as this sun goes down in one part of the world is coming up in another part of the world and it gets passed over so you get a 24-hour working cycle so you've got team management and dealing with all of this as a project manager working with these remote and virtual teams it's really really important that people understand real with great clarity what their responsibilities are and what their response what they're actually expected to do and what level of authority that they have what what can what decisions can they make without you without having to come back to you or come back to somebody else in the organization for support or for permission so make sure all this is well defined and well understood Define the criteria for people to know whether they're doing the job that you need them to be doing. Make sure that they know what is expected of them. Make sure that their interests are being met, their financial, physical, psychological, emotional interests are being met. And again, you're responsible as a project manager for these people within the project. And you need to build that team identity with them, build that sense of belonging and shared identity they are working as part of your project team although you may never see them and we don't have the budgets anymore to jump on a plane and and bring uh you know 20 people together in a central location somewhere in the world to have a project kickoff meeting those sorts of things don't happen as often anymore travel budgets time constraints uh workloads etc all, all getting in the way of this but on the flip side uh, technology is also helping this as well in terms of enabling us with different presence types of presence technologies and we'll talk a bit more about this dealing with virtual teams and remote teams means that you need to be working less reactively and a lot more proactively you need to make sure that people have the information that they need at the beginning of their business day so understanding time zones, understanding work patterns, understanding office hours, uh, all of this comes into making sure that information is flowing in the right way. You will receive issues and challenges from different locations. How do you plan to deal with those within your project team? If you've got a, uh, if you've got a project team working in Europe and uh, you're based on the west coast of North America, the, the time change is pretty phenomenal. It's uh, I don't know, I think it's about eight or nine hours. Uh, so how do you make sure that information that you have or information or problems that they're, they're giving you, that they're resolved in a timely fashion and that they've got the information they need when they get to their next business day? So you react to the urgent requirements, but you plan a lot more planning around dealing with issues before they come up trying to identify and put plans in place about how information will move and how problems will be dealt with on a day-to-day -day rolling basis. We talked a little bit about uh, you know, different presence technologies and really the commercial platforms available for sharing information like the one we're using today. Uh, easy to access, easy to use. There is tons of ways to communicate with people. There are tremendous sharing tools uh, using SharePoint. Um, you know, Microsoft Azure is now out making a SharePoint in the cloud much more easier to access for organizations. Uh, tools like Dropbox, Google Docs, Google Drive. Uh, there's just a myriad of ways to have information shared within a team. Uh, and, and they all work uh, using tools like Slack uh, within, within Teams. Uh, all of this is platform to share, collaborate, and work together as a team, where no matter where you are in the world. The challenge, of course, is having the right uh, IT support for that, and not just having the right IT support in one location, but also having the right IT support in all of the locations where your people are. And I'll give you an example of this. So. Uh, I work with a couple of colleagues on, a, on another business and we're, we're in the midst of setting it up. So I've got uh, one colleague in, in Ontario, I'm based on the west coast of, of uh, Canada, and we have another colleague based in the far north of Canada. Now, far north, great, he's got telephone access, but their bandwidth availability is shockingly low. So we can't uh, have 
you know, virtual, uh, you know, video-based uh, conference conferences. We're emailing information. We're using uh, we're using Dropbox to share files so that you know they can be downloaded when it's Slack time. We spend a lot more time just strictly on audio conference because that is the best that we can do given the constraints of technology in the far north of Canada. And understand those constraints may exist for you in other parts of the world where you've got virtual and remote teams. There's a big advantage, of course, to working with virtual teams and remote teams, and, and that's really the advantage of innovation. We often get very used to working in a particular way uh, in the co-located environments that we're in. And we miss, we potentially miss new and innovative ways of doing something, either building a new product or service or uh, communicating with organizations or, or just generally innovative ways of working. And this is one of the things that we can really gather and, and leverage from this remote and virtual environment is you're looking for opportunities and you're encouraging people in, in, in these different locations to share how they work and look for innovation from them. Look for innovation and new ideas to resolve project, project challenges and, and project issues. Right? You may not know or you may not have run across a particular issue in, in your particular co-located environment, but somebody in another location may have run across something similar. And it may not have been even something similar within your organization, but they may have come from another company or another group and run into something similar. So again, look and ask for uh, ideas from your remote and virtual teams. It can breed, it can be a very, very powerful force. All of this with remote, with remote and virtual teams, again, comes back to stakeholder and stakeholder management. It kind of becomes a little bit different when you're dealing with virtual and remote teams because, again, your stakeholders will be uh, your team's management, their direct leads, their supervisors, their managers, uh, department managers, directors, etc., in the physical locations where they work. So you need to spend time to get to know them as well and build relationships with them, find out what influences them, find out what information they need. Really no different than what we've talked about already with stakeholder mapping, but understanding that you're doing this in a remote environment as well. Look for ways to strengthen the team, of course. Uh, lots of feedback. You're gonna spend a lot more time communicating with people uh, who are working remotely and virtually just to make sure that they actually feel as part of the team and encourage your co-located team members to do the same thing, to reach out to their colleagues in different parts of the world or different parts of the country uh, and make sure that they're sharing information. And it's incumbent on you as a leader, as a project manager, as a manager to encourage this behavior and make sure that it's happening. Set the expectations within your teams, set the challenges, set the opportunities for people to the skill level that they have. Uh, people working remotely and virtually, if you've brought them in, they normally bring a higher level of skill and dedication to the roles because they've been chosen because of their expertise. So if you're dealing with performance plans for these people as part of your, your project management, if it's a longer program of work you may be, then understand your performance plans and, and may reflect some higher expectations from them because of the type of expertise that they're bringing in. Just set the appropriate expectations. That, that's really key to all of this. And of course, recognize achievements. And you know, celebrations in the office, you know, co-located office are pretty easy. You can walk around, and if it's a, you know, if it's a, if it's a big event and it's a major milestone, there might be something a little bit more formal. But how do you do? How do you involve people who are working remotely? Do you teleconference them in if it, if it's possible? Um, think about different ways of doing that. And it may be that you know what you're doing is videoed, and you can send them a video. Uh, about this and making sure that they have been mentioned and making sure that they've been acknowledged uh, clearly in, in recognizing the achievements of the team and recognizing their achievements to, achieve, to generating whatever milestone or, or product or service that you, that you created. You really need to spend time though planning this out. It's not something which will just automatically happen. Regardless of the situation, um, it's all about communication. Right? 
about no different than any other uh, project work, planning work, to find the objectives, assign responsibilities, and manage performance. The only challenge is, is you're doing this, you're spending a lot more time on the phone. I had a colleague move into a, a role about a year and a half ago, and uh, she took a very dysfunctional worldwide project delivery team and within a very short period of time fixed it. And she fixed it by spending six of her eight hours a day on the phone, just talking to people, finding out, getting to know them, finding out where their challenges were, where the communication barriers were. So you will spend, I don't, I don't suggest that you'll be spending six of eight hours on the phone with your teams, but you will spend more time communicating with people who are working virtually and remotely. So wrapping all this up and, and you know dealing with building your teams and building these very powerful teams, whether purely co-located or a combination of co-located and virtual, is we look at the process of delegation and empowering delegation. So empowering delegation doesn't mean that you dump it over the fence and people are just going to automatically know what they're going to be doing. So again, we all know this. We're good project managers. We know that we have to plan the work. We have to identify and validate, validate any assumptions we have about the work. We have to understand the capability of the people doing the work. So we're doing an assessment of, you know, how competent are they? Do they have the right skill sets? Do we need to train people? Understand people's workloads. How stressed are they? Is there, do they have the capability? Do they have the cycles to take on the work that's being asked of them? The delegation process can be quite uh, challenging for some people because you have to sit down and explain the work. Now, if you're a project manager and you're working in an area of technology where you have a good understanding, but you're not the subject matter expert, the delegation process gets a little bit more complicated because you're having to work with somebody else to make sure that the person actually being delegated the work to understands it. So you're working with an SME and you're working with people who are going to be working for or with the SME to actually develop the product or service that you're looking at. But when you're delegating it, you're being very clear on what the expectations are. So what particularly do you want this person to, or group to be doing? What is the expected output? Clearly define what the expected outputs are. And again, communication. Clearly define the timings of the outputs. If you're working in an agile environment, that's great. So you've got, you're working within your sprints, you're working within, you know, when the expected outputs are. Uh, that's again, managed by the, uh, by the sprint leader, by the project manager. If you're working in a waterfall environment, no different. You still have an expectation of when things will be delivered. If it's a longer delivery time frame, do you want interim updates on progress and, you know, define what those will be. And again, falling into the trap of, a percentage of a percentage complete won't probably won't help you but understand what information you need um, get confirmation from people that they understand that they agree and that they will are willing to do the work provide the monitoring and follow-up tools and processes and again clearly documented and this is a cycle it just it never stops so you look for time frame, technology requirements, connections to other projects when you're planning the work. Understand the budget. This is really key, uh, keeping finance and, and your project sponsors on side. And understand the risks about the work that's being done. It's all part and parcel of, again, communicating, getting to know people, understanding capabilities. Do the people have the right skill sets? Do the processes work for what you're trying to do? Is the technology there um, or is there a technology gap? And is there enough policies and practices in place to allow you to keep control of what's going on with the team and with the deliveries? Again, all part of the capability assess assessment. Workload management. Do you know what they're doing, what your, what your team members are doing? Um, do they have enough hours? And if they don't have enough hours, how does prioritization work within the organization? And this comes back to what we spoke about earlier in terms of organizational awareness and understanding where decisions are made. So is there work that will be put on hold or not? Um, is there work that you know an individual that you absolutely need on your project team is doing that can be handed to somebody else? Do you need to bring in contractors? 
All of this comes into your questions about workload management. And all of this comes into the questions about building this highly effective team and this extraordinary project team that you're trying to get in place. Delegation, again, comes down to simply what and who needs, who is going to do it and what has to be done. And look at how you're delegating it, whether you're delegating, delegating to a team or whether you're delegating to a work group. So work groups, you've got one team leader. Um, they understand what has to be done. They sell it to the team, really good in high pressure situations. Um, and the leader holds the team to account. If you're delegating to a team, right? So the team, the most suitable team member is chosen to run the particular team. And delegating to the team is based on dialogue. So you're talking to everybody within the team. So this is really used when you've got a complex situation where there's a number of things that have to be done with a bunch of different skill sets. So the team takes the work and understands the work and then together they sort out how they're going to accomplish the work uh, and they work together to get it done. So just different styles and examples of different ways of delegating. Okay, so again, with work groups, you have pretty high expectations for team members. Um, it challenges less experienced people and you're looking to match skills and strengths to tasks. With teams, it's really at a different level about understanding the goal of the project and what those required deliverables are to support the goal. So you're working with the team to make sure that everything is identified that has to be done. Now, the thing is with really good teams of people, they'll find their own ways of organizing the work based on their particular areas of expertise and it will change from project to project and from team to team uh, if you've got a really strong team uh, best to just let them get on with it uh, provide them guidance and provide them you know the touch points and basis but again you're trusting them and you're delegating them to getting it done the art of contracting of course is just making sure that everybody knows what has to be done and when it has to be done. Uh, again, the more communication, the more clarity you've got around this, the less likely you're gonna have issues around uh, misunderstanding about what is expected. Again, the better you have with this, the better you're dealing in the delegation process, the more effective your team is going to be because you're always trying to minimize wasted time and effort. So it's all about plans. Again, we come back to this upstream and downstream communication plans. This is the same thing that you're doing with your team delegation. Again, understanding who needs this information. Once you've worked through this whole process, review it with your team. Make sure that everybody's got this understanding of what has to be done, when it has to be done, and who has to be reported to. And again, get this confirmation. You want people to say the words, yes, I will do it, and yes, I will do it on time. And yes, if I have an issue, I will let you know early so that we can address it. And that last point, I think, is probably most important, that you're creating an environment where people will talk to you and advise you of things going sideways. So you're monitoring this process, you're monitoring what's going on, and you're receiving information from your team. Um, and again, early on in the piece, you've decided what information you want, when you want it, and also what information you need to give out to people and when you need to give it out to people as well. And then finally, follow up. So you're reviewing the work to be done and you're encouraging people to review their own work. And at the end of the whole project and program, find out what they've learned and find out what they would do differently. Take that on board and move that into you, the rest of your work and share that with your colleagues. Find out what kind of challenges they might be ready for next. All of this is about leveraging your leadership skills to get work done. And that, that's really what this whole webinar has been talking about. Diving into your leadership skills, motivating people, delegating to people, understanding communications, understanding organizational politics, uh, and dealing effective dealing effectively with them. We've touched on a lot of things and there is a lot more to all of these topics. But this gives you an idea of 
some of the things that you need to be concerned with as a, a strong project managers and project leaders and program managers and program directors and program leaders. So uh, with that, I will say thank you very much uh, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you everyone for joining us today. If you guys have any questions, um, feel, please feel free to type those in now and we will go ahead and ask Brian and address those over audio. I also want to encourage you all, if you are interested in any of the material presented in this webinar or any of our available course offerings, uh, please reach out to your local New Horizons for further information. And if you are not familiar with your local New Horizons, you can log on to newhorizons.com and do a zip code search to find the center nearest you. I also want to let you know that this session is being recorded. You will receive a link to view the session recording later today, as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation for you to review or pass on to any colleagues who were unable to join us. We have a number of upcoming webinars that you can register for, and these are all complimentary to you. So uh, if you visit our website at newhorizons.com, click on the webinars link, and then you will see a full list of upcoming webinars to register for. You can also catch our past webinars um, in our recording archive library, so you can view those at any time you'd like as well. Brian, it looks like we don't have any questions, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up today's session. Thank you again so much. We always love when you come speak on behalf of New Horizons. My absolute pleasure. And thank you again, everyone. I hope you all have a great day. That will conclude today's session. You may now log off. Take care. Have a great day.